discussing the resurrection. Um, this is where, you know, we can, you know, we've got three episodes that we're going to talk about in the lesson today, three different events, three different times where Jesus, the risen Lord, made himself visible and known to individuals that knew him on the earth, and, and they knew that he had perished, that he had died on the cross, but he is going to uh, uh, show himself again. And this was so important for the faith because even though Jesus told his disciples, and, and who knows how many others, that this was going to happen, it still took them by shock. You know, it's almost like it really didn't sink into the disciples that he meant what he was saying. They couldn't fully understand when, when he said that, you know, these things must happen to me. I'm going to suffer many things, but then I'll rise again, or I will lay this body down and, and, and bring it back up three days. They, they fully didn't understand this, so when it happened, it was traumatizing. And, you know, I'm so thankful that he appeared in his resurrected form to these individuals as a testimony so that their faith could grow. Because when you really look at it, can you imagine our own faith today if we could see the resurrected Lord? If you had an eyewitness account of the resurrected Lord where you saw him, you physically saw him, he spoke to you, and you knew that he was the Lord and Savior, how would that change your life here on earth in a powerful way in your faith? And that's what it had to do to these individuals because they knew the power that Christ had. They loved the teachings of Christ. The miracles were evidence of his divinity. They knew that this was the, the, their Savior, but yet it was only after they saw the risen Lord did their faith increase so much that they were willing to li die for this cause. They were going to face some of the greatest persecution Christians had ever faced. And yet, when, when the Bible tells us that over 500 people witnessed him or saw the resurrected Lord, these 500 people will go to their deaths, most likely, and not waver a bit. Because once they saw him, their faith was solid. At that point, there was no turning back. At that point, this church, the Lord's church, was going forth and they were going to be the witnesses. They were going to be the ones with the testimonials. They saw the risen Christ, and because of that, you can't convince them that he's not living. You couldn't convince those early church believers that, there, that Christ was still in that tomb. When you think about it, I put a list down here of all the things that give us credibility for the risen Lord. The Old Testament had prophecies all through it. The Old Testament was full of prophecies about the, the, the Son of God coming and, and being ri raised again. Christ himself on the earth predicted it. He told us that this was going to happen. It's mentioned over a hundred times in the New Testament. Writers of the New Testament would write about this. This was the predominant message preached about by the early church, by these disciples, by these preachers. That was the predominant message was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He is alive. The tomb was obviously empty. They could never even recover it. This is the thing that just mind boggles me is that the priest and the religious people of the day, they heard Jesus loud and clear when he said he's going to raise this temple up in three days. So much so that remember when he died, they went to the Roman government and said, now listen, we think his, his disciples are going to steal this body because he mentioned he was going to raise this body up in three days. Put a couple guards there. And the Roman government you know, acquiesced to it and said, okay, we'll put some guards there to guard the tomb. So the priest believed it more than, more than the followers did at times that he was going to raise again because they were wanting some guards to stop this thing. And because the, the tomb was empty, they, have never, they, they could never recover the body. Can you not believe that the, that the greatest uh, manhunt ever of all time had to take place after the resurrection with this religious body of Pharisees. Man, I bet they sent everybody searching for this body. They had to find this body, and to this day, they didn't find the body and still have it. The evidence is so clear for us uh, that the body was, uh, Christ was seen by over 500 individuals and as we said earlier, that has catapulted the church with a never-ending faith and belief that he is risen and the church is built on that foundation. And we, though we have not seen the eyewitness account that we're going to talk about today, 
uh, we are like, Jesus had us in mind when he uh, showed Thomas his hands and feet. You know, when Thomas doubted and he showed him, look at my hands and feet. And he told Thomas, says, you know, you are, you are believed because you're seeing it. But blessed are those in 2024 who haven't seen it but yet believed. And that's us. We're the ones that are blessed because we haven't seen the eyewitness account of the resurrected Lord, but we still believe because of what the scriptures tell us, what the eyewitnesses account tell us, and we accept it and believe it fully. So as we get into today's lesson, the three events that are going to take place are meaning what the whole purpose of this particular Easter Sunday is we're wanting to talk about it. How can we, can, how can we have a personal relationship with an actual resurrected Lord and Savior who's sitting on the right hand of God? You know, these events here, these people are going to see him. They're going to talk to him. They're going to have a conversation with him. They're going to eat with him. We can't really do that here as far as him sitting across the table and we see him and talk to him and eat with him. But through the Holy Spirit that Jesus himself knew that we would need and he sent him to us, we can still have the personal relationship with him because although Jesus can't be visibly here on the earth with us and in his, in his bodily form that he walked the earth with, but the Holy Spirit is still him. The Trinity allows us to have Jesus in our hearts through the Holy Spirit, and that's how we have the personal relationship through him is through that Holy Spirit that's residing in our hearts. And Jesus wants to know where our heart is, and that's what we're going to talk about because that's where the relationship starts. The book of John. We're going to take a break from John the letters and go to John the gospel today. And the book of John is going to give us two of our examples of, of a real life eyewitness accounts. These will be very familiar to us. We've been talking about and preaching about and teaching about Easter for my, you know, 50 of my 55 years that I can remember. And it's just, you know, when, when we read this, we, it, we always want to continue to soak it in as where would, if we put ourselves in the shoes of these individuals. So in the 20th chapter of John, it says, but Mary stood without at the sepulcher, so weeping. What we've got is several gospels. We've got four gospels and they all have variations of the same event. And what we do know is that Mary went to the tomb with several women and when they went in and saw that the tomb was, uh, was empty, that the, ro the stone was rolled away, several of the women went in and looked at it. Mary stayed outside weeping because she knew his body was gone. The other women run back to, to, um, um, to where they came from, where the, the, the disciples were gathered. But Mary stays there. She's weeping. She's distraught. Apparently did not go into the tomb when the other women were there. So Mary stood without or on the outside of the sepulcher weeping. And, and as she wept... She then stooped down and looked into the sepulcher and seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had laid, very similar to the Ark of the Covenant, where the cherubims, when God commanded that the Ark of the Covenant be made, he wanted the mercy seat in the middle, and on each side of the mercy seat, he wanted cherubim with their wings touching each other. Mary stoops down, didn't know if she really had an idea of what the Ark of the Covenant was, but she looks down at the tomb where the body of Jesus was laying, and he had two angels at the head and the feet. And she sees these angels, and they said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Woman was not a disrespectful, you know, if we say that to a woman, if we say that to a, if I come up to you the, today and I, and I refer to you as woman, that's usually disrespectful. In our Western culture, you call people by the name. Back then, it wasn't meant as a dis, disrespectful comment. It was basically, we don't know if the angels did not know who Mary was or if this was just a common referral. Now, I'd like to think that they knew what was coming and they just referred to her as woman and when they say, woman, why weepest thou? And she says unto them, because they, whoever they are, have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Now, this is one of the things that has confused uh, Christians for forever. And that how we don't know what the resurrected body of Jesus looked like at this state. We know that the, all of these events, they're not going to recognize him by sight at first. All right. And I think that's important. 
Jesus in his resurrected state is in the garden. Number one, Mary is not expecting her Lord to be standing there, so she has no expectation of this. And that's, you know, that's a lesson to learn in itself. We don't know how much Mary actually knew about the prediction that Christ would rise again. We assume that, you know, we, we don't know how much of a person, personal uh, uh, relationship she had with the disciples. You never really see them conversing. So we don't know how much knowledge Mary knew what the disciples knew about Jesus predicting that I'm going to rise again. So she's not expecting him there. So the expectation is part of it. She's reasoning things out at this point. She's weeping and she sees a man. And the first reasonable thing that she sees that pops in her mind is it must be the gardener. Who else would be here right at the crack of dawn? It can't be my Lord and Savior, Jesus. Jesus. It's, it's got to be the gardener. So reason and uh, unexpected, uh, uh, the unexpectedness of the person being there has concluded in her mind that this must be the gardener because she can't make his face out to be resembling of Jesus. That's all we can take out of what we're reading in the scriptures. So she is assuming that it is the gardener because uh, she says in verse 15, Jesus said unto her, woman, why weepest thou? And whom do you seek? Who seekest thou? Jesus, his voice, it's interesting. He's talking to her. His first thing is asking her a question. She doesn't recognize her, not, uh, she doesn't recognize him, and he knows that. It's possibly on purpose, and he is speaking to her, and he says, Woman, why do you weep, and who do you seek? She, still supposing him to be the gardener, said unto him, Sir, if thou hast borne him hence, if you've taken him somewhere, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. Now, this shows a woman's heart. Because here, a dead body wrapped in, you know, 10, 20 pounds of linen cloth and ointment and all that. And she thinks she's just going to go pick him up and take him somewhere. She's not thinking that rationally. She just wants to know where he is so that she can take him away. And Jesus said unto her, the second time his voice projected toward her, and he said, Mary. He calls her by her name. She turned herself Apparently looking away from him and she hears her name, meaning that it's personal and there's something relational. There's a relationship there. She knew the voice when the Lord addressed her. She didn't pick up on his voice when it said, when it was just woman. But when he personalized it, the voice she recognized. And she turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, master, she recognized him. The first event that we read about today is basically Mary, who we know had a love for the Lord. Her heart was pure. She was weeping profusely because she believed in her, in her heart and mind that the evidence in front of her that he was gone. Now she sees someone that she can speak to. No matter, you know, I can't imagine what uh, the, 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 the angels, seeing the angels may have done to her as well, but seeing the only person you know, there that was of human form she asked, where have you taken him? And then when he personalized and calls her Mary, she knows his voice at that point. Now, this is fascinating to us. Well, we've talked about this for years, but I want to read something out of John uh, chapter 10. Now, Jesus is talking about, through John here, he's talking about a common thing that happened every day in biblical days with shepherds. All right, and we've, we've read this, but I just want to read it again because it's very important for what Mary had just witnessed. It said, Verily, verily, in chapter 10, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold. What is the sheepfold? It's kind of a corral. Don't know how big this is. I don't know what it looks like. But I do, I have read where in the biblical days, sheep were everywhere. And if you were a shepherd, you had a flock, but it was only a small amount of the overall sheep herd that was out there. And at night, they would keep all the sheep in this big corral. Could have been acres and acres of things. Don't know. But it was all kept in, in the same pen. And it says, Jesus says, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door comes right through the door, the gate, is the shepherd of the sheep. 
To him, the person who enters into the door, the porter or the gatekeeper openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. He calleth his own sheep by name. Interesting. Jesus is telling this story to whomever would believe him, whoever would hear him. He is saying the shepherd, the true shepherd, will go into the gate where sheep are everywhere. He's got a flock, and he will call them out by name and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. The beauty of that, to me, is that not only does Jesus call them out by name, but the sheep that are mixed in with possibly hundreds of other sheep, they know when they are being addressed by the voice of their shepherd, and they will follow. I can visualize all these sheep grazing, some guy walking in and calling out names or giving a yelp of, 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 that the sheep are familiar with, and you, hear, you see about 100 heads come up out of thousands of sheep. 100 heads come up, and they look, and they know their master, and they turn, and they follow him. And as he's yelling and spe speaking, they follow him out for their daily activities. It's a powerful example, a true example, of exactly what's happening here with Mary. When he personalized her name, when he called her by name, with his voice, she recognized him. She didn't have to see and recognize his face. She knew, she knew the personal part of this. And where I'm getting is, as we talk about all of these episodes, it seems to be Jesus doesn't want us to believe in him because of what we see. He wants us to believe in him because of our, per, our personal relationship with him. Things that we connect with Jesus. We, we walk not by sight, but by faith. And what we know our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ is. Mary had a personal relationship with Jesus. She didn't have to recognize him with her eyes. Even though that would have been helpful. For whatever reason, Jesus did not want her to notice him. He wanted to connect to her through her heart. What was in her heart, that was the reconnection. And it came with Mary by just the mentioning of her name. That's all it took to reconnect that heart. So we go to the second event. It's only told in the book of Luke, even though Mark makes a quick reference to it. Matthew doesn't mention it. John doesn't mention this one. Mark makes a small reference to it. But Luke really, Mr. Detail, the physician, he gets, he, you know, Luke does this on many occasions. He gets in, down into the details. He's going to tell of an episode where two disciples who are not part of the 11 that are remaining that we know of, these are two other disciples that know of what has just occurred with the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, it's coming out of this um, Luke 24, it's coming out of when the women come back and tell, Luke says they came back to the 11 and all the others and tell them what they have just witnessed, that the tomb is empty, the body is he's gone, he's raised from the dead, and you know, and, and the 11 disciples and all the others that were assembled heard this. So we are under the assumption that the two that are going to be taking a trip to Emmaus were part of that group. Now, interestingly enough, we don't know who these two individuals, well, let me say we know one because Luke will tell us the name. It's a Cleopas is the name of one of these two disciples that are going to take a seven mile journey to Emmaus on the same day that the women saw the tomb empty. We don't know why they were going to Emmaus. What a strange time. You know, after you've just heard what you've heard, let's take a trip to Emmaus. We don't know what was going on, but they're on their way. Luke tells us that a man named Cleopas, which we, if we dig into Cleopas, uh, the Dake reference Bible says Cleopas was actually uh, the father of one of the 11 named James the Less. You know, you got James as a disciple who's the brother of John. You got a second James that they refer to as James the Less, and he had a mother named Mary that was at the tomb with the others. Cleopas was her husband, according to Dake. And therefore, Cleopas was one of the two men on the way to Emmaus. Now, some will say that the other, the other uh, uh, person possibly could have been Luke himself, simply because it was his style not to refer to himself and he was the only one of the, of the gospel, wrote the only gospel that really gave detailed information of this event. 
and he was the only one that actually spoke of in detail back when Jesus had the 70 disciples and sent them out to heal the sick and all that. None of the other really gospels talk about those 70 like Luke does. So it's anticipated that maybe Luke was one of the 70. On the flip side of that, so we can't claim that to be absolute scripture, uh, the flip side of that is a lot believe that Luke was from uh, Antioch out of Syria and actually was converted to Christianity during that great revival up in Antioch when the church in Jerusalem would send Barnabas up there. Said, we got a great revival, go up to Barnabas. They think that's where Luke met Paul and all that. So we don't know, but it's fascinating to dig in. And it's, fa it's fascinating as we talk about this blessed day that it could have been. But we just know that there were two men Two disciples who were not part of the eleven on their way a seven mile journey to the village, and as they were there, as they were walking, um, let me read a little bit of this. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, as they were talking, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. He just joined in as a, like a stranger. But their eyes were holding that they should not know him. Here again, they can't recognize him. Is this on purpose? We have to assume everything that Jesus does is on purpose, so it's got to be on purpose that they don't recognize him. Here again, Jesus trying to get at the heart of the matter. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that you have one to another? What are you talking about? As you walk and are sad. Jesus once again asking the question. He's sparking a conversation. He asked Mary, Whom seeketh thou? He's asking these men, what are you talking about? You seem so sad, and I'm, I'm, I hear you talking. What are you talking about? So then they, one of them, the Cleophas says, Art thou a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which have come to pass these last few days? And he said unto them, What things? This is Jesus, inquisitive. What things are you talking about? And they said upon him, unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth. He was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. And yet certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early in this, at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even to be so as the women had said. But him they saw not. Now here's what Jesus is, is getting information. He is asking for the con, uh, communication. He's building, he's having a relationship talk with these two disciples that have heard him speak, that have seen his miracles, that possibly could have been two of the 70 that went out and, and you know, uh, brought out devils from possessed people and healed the sick. They are certainly believers in Christ, but they themselves are struggling with the news. They are sad. They can't, they're confused. They don't fully understand. And Jesus gets frustrated with this. You know, he, can, he, he chides them a little bit as he, as the scriptures will say, he then starts telling them about the scriptures, reminding them, these two men, how the scriptures in the Old Testament had predicted this event to happen. How that he, in his conversations with them, uh, how, how the Savior would have um, you know, been a, predicted that this would happen. He's bringing out all the scriptures to show these men that they shouldn't be sad this was all predicted and prophesied. They were fascinated, but they still were not convinced of who they were walking with. So as the story goes, they're getting close to town. And instead of breaking apart and saying, well, it's nice talking to you, they ask him. They bid him to come and dwell with us. Stay with us. We're going to have supper. Come and sup with us. And Jesus, still not being recognized, agrees and they go to a place where they uh, go to the village. And, and, and this is where your, your quarterly picks up. In verse 28, it says, And they drew nigh unto the village of Emmaus, and wh whither they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward the evening time, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat, as he sat at supper with them, as he was dining with them, that he took bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and gave it to them. 
He gave them the bread. All right, that's a key part of this. And their eyes were opened. We have to assume that the scriptures mean immediately. The event, they've been talking to him for hours and not recognizing him. They've asked him to come and, and dine with them, and he's chosen to do so. They've sat down with him. Bread has been set before them. And they, instead of taking the bread themselves and, and giving to their stranger friend, the stranger friend grabs the bread. He breaks it. He blesses it. And he hands it to them. And immediately their eyes were open and they knew him. They didn't know him by recognizing his face. They knew him because of something that just happened. And he, have, he vanished out of their sight at that point. And here's the thing that's interesting. And they said one to another. We have to assume that as immediately as he vanished in front of them. Here they've spent hours with him. They know he's a physical being. He just broke bread and handed it to them. And then as soon as their eyes are open, and before they could say a word to him, he vanishes. And they looked at one another and they said, did not our heart. That's right there in the scripture. Did not our heart. Jesus is after the heart. Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures. What caused them to finally recognize Jesus? That has been you know, discussed and debated for centuries, no doubt. But we have to understand something took place with the breaking of the bread. Was it something that they remembered with their relationship with Jesus when he was on the earth before the crucifixion? That he would give communion, that he would break the bread and hand to them. Was that breaking of bread, that, that, that ritual that they would do, this is my body that is broken. Did that spark them? Was that spirit ignited inside of them once they recognized, even though they couldn't see his face, we walk by faith, not by sight. They couldn't see him and recognize him, but yet something inside of them was stirred in their heart and in their, in their spirit because of the breaking of bread. Or was it was that the first time that as he handed them the bread, they could see the nail prints in his hands? Is that something that could have happened? You know, all this time they've walked and talked, couldn't recognize him, but when a man stretches forth his hands to give you bread, and there's nail prints in his hands, is this when their eyes were open? We'll never know. It'll be something we have to ask them when we, when we see them in heaven. But it's what, what we do know is that their hearts were stirred by what the event took place. Once again, it is all about the heart. And God and Jesus is trying to stir the heart of every uh, person that is a believer because that's where our relationship is. That's where we have our relationship with Christ is in the heart. Mary, these, these two men on the Emmaus, Jesus was after the heart. So we get to the book of John again, our third uh, episode event that we're talking about today. Now, before we jump into the book of John, this is one that's, you know, sometimes it can be confusing because um, all of a sudden these disciples who were in Jerusalem who the women have just seen an empty tomb and ran back and told the disciples he's gone. When we go to John, all of a sudden they're in Galilee. And that makes kind of this a strange episode. Why did they leave Jerusalem to go to Galilee? But in Matthew, Matthew's rendition of the, the, of the, of the resurrection says that, the, that Jesus appeared to the women after they saw the empty sepulcher and the tomb was empty. And on their way back, Jesus appeared to them and told them, go to my disciples and tell them that I will meet them in Galilee. I will see them in Galilee. Go to Galilee. So we don't know whether the two men going to Emmaus, that you know, when they saw, when they, when they recognized Jesus and he vanished and they immediately got up and went back to Jerusalem to tell the 11 and all the others, we have just seen it. And Jesus sees them there too. Jesus goes in front of all the disciples. He's appearing to them in Jerusalem. We don't know if all that took place. We assume that took place before they went to Galilee or after they'd come back from Galilee. We're not sure, but except that we do believe that the Galilee was afterwards. Because we know that in, in the book of John, when, when he gets to the disciples, part of this He's got them in Galilee to a point where Peter, as they're going back to where they're, you know, all the disciples were from the Galilean area. And they're going back home. 
and seven of them decide that they're going to go fishing, which is their pre previous occupation. Strange occurrence, but maybe they thought, well, we need, to, we need more funds. We need to, you know, this is a big deal. We're, you know, we don't know the meaning or the reason why they decide to go fishing, but they're going fishing. And this is their occupation. So Peter and James and John and several others are gathering together, and they're out fishing when Jesus appears on the shore. Now, he's already, been, he's already seen them and been with them a couple of times. This is going to be the third appearance that Jesus has with his disciples. They're out there fishing in the Sea of Tiberias, and they're catching nothing all night. And so the morning comes about, and they've got nothing to show for a night of fishing. And, and Jesus from the shore yells out, you know, how many fish did you catch? And I'm paraphrasing. And they yell, nothing here, not a bad night. And he tells them, and they still don't recognize him. They don't hear his voice. They don't recognize him. And they, he says, cast your, your nets on the right side of the ship. That would be something that would trigger me. He'd already told them that when he called them to be his disciples. That would trigger my, my thoughts, but they do it. They throw it on the, other, the right side of the ship, and they come in, and they've got a, a whole bunch of a net full of fish on the right-hand side. Hadn't caught anything all night. This voice on the, on the shore tells them to cast your net on the other side, and they bring it in, just like they did when they were called. John, on the ship immediately, he recognizes it, and he says, Peter, that's the Lord. That's the Lord, because I'm recognizing an event that took place that has stirred my heart. When Jesus touched us early, I recognize what we're doing and how it's connected me back to Jesus. I can't recognize him physically. I'm not going by my sight. I'm going by my memory and what he's done for us in the past. And that's my relationship with him being stirred in my heart. That's the Lord. Peter recognizes immediately and jumps in. He, he jumps in the water. He don't, he don't have time to, to row to shore. He's going to swim to shore. That's showing his heart. Peter, the one that denied him three times, he's showing his heart. He, Y'all bring in the fish yourself. I'm going to see the Savior. So he's, he's swimming in, and John's over there trying to get the, 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 the fish in. And then they come in behind Peter. And when we get to the quote today, or to the, the event in the lesson today, it says, So when they had dined, Jesus has got a spread there. He's got a little grill or whatever, and he's cooking bread and fish. And he's wanting to eat with them. So here's the resurrected Lord eating with them. And when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, he takes Peter uh, off. He takes Peter to himself. And he says, son of S Peter, uh, he says, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He's talking about the other disciples with him. Do you love me more than the other ones love me? A strange thing to say, but you have to remember that Peter, days before, right before the crucifixion, Peter was the one when someone said that, you know, when Jesus said they're going to, you know, they're, they're going to come and they're going to, um, you know, they're going to take me and I'll have to suffer and, and the sheep will, will scatter. And Peter says, oh, not me, Lord, not me. And all these others may run, but I'm going to be there. I'm going to be with you. And, and that's when Jesus told him that he would deny him when, when, about before the cock crew three times. So he's remembering that conversation with Peter. And he's telling Peter, do you really love me more than these other disciples do? As you told me you you were back in the, when we had our previous conversation. And Peter says, yes, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And he said unto him, feed my lambs. He's telling him, I want you to be a leader of my lambs, a protector of my lambs, a, a teacher of my lambs. He said to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And Peter said unto him, yes, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And then Jesus said, feed my sheep. And then the third time, and we know where Jesus and why Jesus is doing this. Peter had denied him three times. Peter was very aware of the three times that he denied him. And Jesus has asked him three times. Peter was grieved when he asked him, well, again, once again, son of Jonas, do you really love me? And Peter was grieved in his heart because he said unto him the third time, do you love me? And Peter, through his heart, out of his heart, he says, when his heart is grieved, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And this is where it's going to come in. He says, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. The message didn't change. He wanted Peter to be a leader. He wanted Peter to preach the gospel, feed the sheep, tend to the sheep, which is his, his followers, but he wanted to connect to Peter's heart. He wanted, he, not only did he say this three times to back up or to, uh, to uh, compensate for the three denials, 
But the last time is what sparks me, is all three of these events. Mary he reached her heart when he made it personal with her name. And out of her heart, she, she called out Master. The two men on the way to Emmaus, they didn't recognize him. But when he broke bread and they saw the nails in his hands and they saw, you know, their eyes were open and they, tell, they told each other, did not our heart burn within us when we spoke with him? Reminding them of a relationship they have. And here Peter, after a meal of fish and bread, Jesus asked me, do you really love me more than everybody? Yes, Lord, I do. Ask him the second time, yes, Lord, I do. Third time, his heart is grieved. The very thing that Jesus wants out of all of us is our heart. Peter's heart is grieved, and out of that repentant heart and grieving heart, his, heart, his mouth speaks out of that heart and says, you know all things, Lord. You know that I love you. You know it. You know I have no problem with telling you that I love you because you know me. You know my heart. And I love you in my heart. And Jesus complete, completed the thing, never breaking away from the simple message from the beginning, feed my sheep. You know, he didn't, he didn't change the message on every time he asked him. It was going to be feed my sheep, but he wanted that heart connection, that relationship. The purpose of Easter that we celebrate it so much is because, like these individuals, we can have the personal relationship with Jesus through our heart. You know, in today's time, I thought about this mowing yesterday. Today's world, we actually can say we've got a relationship with some entertainer because we follow them on Twitter or, or some social media thing. We're one of five million followers. Every time our, our entertainer says something on Twitter, you know, we may say, well, I can follow my entertainer. I can follow. I've got a relationship with this person because I know what they're saying. I know everything they're doing. I understand what, they're, what they feel. I've got a connection, but that is not the connection Jesus wants. We've got, his, we've got the word of God that can tell us everything that Jesus said. But to have the personal relationship with him comes from the heart. It's not just being a follower through reading his word. It's following him in, his, in our heart and having him live in our heart and in our bodies. And, and the Holy Spirit allows us to do that. Jesus is not physically on the earth anymore. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father, but the Holy Spirit is here, and it is the same, and he is in our hearts, and he goes into our hearts where our heart is perfect with, before God through the Holy Spirit, and we have, that's what we nurture and keep in our relationship. Easter is a blessed event because it reminds us of who we are in Christ and what he has provided for us. We have no fear of tomorrow. We have no fear of death because of the resurrection. I don't worry about when, how, or why, it's that when it's done, I will be with the Lord because of what he's done. We'll enjoy today. We'll enjoy the rest of this service. We'll think about him all day. We'll be back next week and get back into the letters of John. Hope you have a good day.